Welcome back to Horrifying Stories. In one of our previous episodes, we featured the horrifying crash of Space Shuttle Columbia during its re-entry in 2003. This time, we take you back to that fateful day on January 28, 1986 when the first major Space Shuttle disaster happened. In just 37 seconds after its liftoff, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded killing all seven crew members on board. This is their horrifying story. Viewer discretion is advised. It had been five years since the first mission of the Space Shuttle program was launched on April 12, 1981, with the goal of building the International Space Station or ISS. That year, a total of 12 shuttle missions were lined up including the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. It was January 28, 1986 and NASA's Space Shuttle program was on its 25th mission as it was set out to launch Space Shuttle Challenger's 10th mission into space. The mission was planned to spend six days in space, mainly to install a large communication satellite, then launch and recover an astronomy payload to study Halley's Comet, and to achieve a record of the world's first ever teacher in space. The satellite called the Tracking and Data Relay System TDRS, was the second of many satellites that will be installed in space. Once fully set up, this network of satellites was seen to facilitate almost non-stop communication during shuttle missions. The astronomy payload, a scientific instrument that is positioned in a satellite, made by NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, was called the Spartan Halley Astronomy Satellite. It was scheduled to be deployed on Challenger's third day in space and was intended to take two days to observe Halley's Comet. Now, observing Halley's Comet would be a major milestone as this happens only once in 76 years after having orbited around the Sun. Lastly, the world's first ever teacher in space activity was scheduled on Challenger's sixth day in space. The teacher, Krista McAuliffe, was a high school social studies teacher from New Hampshire Middle School and was set out to do two live sessions that will be broadcasted in schools across America. The first live session would be entitled, The Ultimate Field Trip, where it aims to show how different life was on board the space shuttle. The second one on the other hand, aims to let the students understand the vital role of research in space. Other videos were also planned to be recorded showing what it's like in space in the absence of gravity. Krista was only one of seven crew members to board Space Shuttle Challenger that day. In command of the spacecraft was Francis Richard Scobby, a Vietnam veteran and Air Force test pilot. Pilot Michael Smith was a Navy combat and test pilot who, although an experienced A-6 intruder pilot, was a first-timer shuttle pilot. A former Air Force test pilot, Ellison Onizuka, who became a scientist astronaut was also one of the crew members. He and Ron McNair, a PhD physicist who wanted to do more research in space, had been trained to perform contingency spacewalk tasks like manually shutting the payload bay doors close. Judy Resnick, a PhD in electrical engineering, was tasked to control the shuttle's remote manipulator system, a robotic arm that will facilitate launching and retrieving of the satellites. This would be her second mission, after having successfully performed the same task in a 1984 mission. Last but not the least was Greg Jarvis, an engineer and satellite designer for the space division of Hughes Corporation. He was the mission's payload specialist. Space Shuttle Challenger arrived at NASA's Kennedy Space Center or KSC on November 11, 1985 after its STS-61A mission. It was immediately brought to the Orbiter Processing Facility to remove the Space Lab module from the payload bay and NASA team started working on refurbishing the spacecraft. By December 9, Spartan Halley payload was positioned inside the Space Shuttle. After one week, Space Shuttle Challenger was pulled to the Vehicle Assembly Building or VAB so it could be attached to its external tank and solid rocket boosters before it was positioned at Launch Pad 39B. The TDRS satellite arrived on January 5, 1986 and it was immediately loaded onto the Challenger's payload bay. From January 8 to 9, NASA engineers performed a dry run for the actual launch countdown called the Terminal Countdown Demonstration Test or TCDT. During the final testing phase, 
The seven astronauts of Challenger's STS-51L mission took part in the dry run as they simulated boarding the spacecraft like it was the actual launch day, except that at the end of the countdown, the main engine would not be turned on. Aside from the countdown, the seven crew members also did escape drills and practiced how to climb into rescue baskets in cases of emergency. The press were also quick to document their activity and the crew even accommodated quick interviews from news channels and had their pictures taken with the shuttle as background. Initially, the launch was set on January 23rd, but because of unforeseen delays on a supposedly prior mission, it was moved to January 26th. However, the forecasted weather on the 26th pushed the launch date further to the 27th. By January 27th, the seven-member crew boarded the Challenger in what was to be their first attempt as they encountered a mechanical issue and failed to proceed with the launch. When the issue was resolved, another Challenger rose as strong winds prohibited them from resuming their attempt. The following day, January 28, 1986, everyone returned to their positions as they were set out to make another attempt. It had been exceptionally cold the previous night but NASA managers didn't see the need to push back the launch further. And so, the crew once again boarded the Challenger. Because this was the first of the Teacher in Space program, the media also gathered at the KSC to witness such a historic event. Off-site, schools across the country were also eagerly anticipating to witness this momentous event for teachers and students alike, via live broadcast in their respective classrooms or auditoriums. Behind the scenes, however, a few NASA engineers had started to raise concerns about the impact of extremely cold temperatures on the integrity of O-rings in SRB segment joints. However, the decision of NASA managers to proceed with the launch prevailed. By 11.38 a.m. Eastern Time, countdown for the liftoff of the Challenger began. Right when the spacecraft successfully lifted off of its launch pad from KSC in Florida, Control of the spacecraft also transitioned from KSC's Launch Control Center to the Mission Control Center in NASA's Johnson Space Center located in Texas. It was now the Mission Control's function to closely monitor the mission's progress. Capsule communicator Richard Covey took over communications with the crew immediately after liftoff and everything went well, at least for the first minute. Then, suddenly 73 seconds after liftoff, Data transmitted from the spacecraft were completely lost and the live broadcast on TV screens showed the Challenger becoming a ball of fire. The spacecraft disintegrated mid-air as the whole country watched in disbelief through various news channels that covered the launch, including the live broadcast in schools across America. Then a few minutes later, the Mission Control Center formally announced that Challenger had exploded, tragically killing all seven crew members on board. Later that day, President Ronald Reagan addressed the whole nation on TV, especially the crew's grieving families and NASA, in a sorrowful yet heartwarming message. He honored the crew's bravery and credited them for their remarkable contribution to the future discoveries despite their untimely deaths. A few days later, investigators initially identified the most probable cause for the tragic accident, that the rubber seal between two parts of one solid rocket booster had failed, causing leakage in the gas tank and eventually leading to the explosion. When the booster exploded, the Challenger got detached along with the explosion before breaking apart due to aerodynamic stresses. The crew however remained intact as it was expected. They were later retrieved from beneath the ocean, still strapped to their seats. The space shuttle didn't actually explode, it just broke apart seconds after the explosion of the boosters. President Ronald Reagan then formed a special task force to look into what had happened and establish corrective and preventive measures for future space shuttle missions. After thorough investigation, the elastic O-ring seal in one of the two solid fuel rockets did not respond as expected due to extremely cold temperatures. Left as is, it became the recipe for disaster. This failure could have been possibly prevented if there were established policies and handling when it comes to safety-related concerns. Because of the tragic incident, the Space Shuttle program was suspended for more than two years as NASA worked on redesigning the Space Shuttle. By September 1988, the suspension of the Space Shuttle program was finally lifted, enabling the successful launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. Meanwhile, a copy of the memorial plaque given by NASA to each of the crew's families had been displayed at the NASA Museum. Along with it were pictures of the seven crew members on that mission, 
a mission patch and a small U.S. flag which they were able to obtain from the debris recovered. Families of the crew members also eventually put up the Challenger Learning Center for Space Science Education to honor the lives of the crew members and to continue the legacy that they have started. Thank you for making it this far. Please click the like button and subscribe to our channel for more of these horrifying stories. If you have any story suggestions, drop a comment down below as we would love to hear from you. Once again, thank you and see you on the next one.